I'm Spartacus. If I'm being really honest, actually, that I've had to try really hard to get Pompeii wrong. Fantastic. Absolute rubbish. My name is Dr. Simon Elliott, historian, archeologist, and broadcaster. And today I'm going to be reviewing Roman movies. Oh, fantastic. Right, this is the opening scene from the movie Gladiator. There is the Marcomannic King holding the head up of a Roman uh, messenger who he didn't like very much. Oh, and he's giving it back to the Romans, which is quite nice. What do you, Quintus? So Maximus was actually a real general. He was a contemporary of Septimius Severus and Pertinax, who later both became emperors themselves, and also um, the imperial candidates, Pescanius Niger and Clodius Albinus, who fought Severus. So, so in terms of the historical setting for this battle, there's a reality to it. <laughs> Kit's not bad, so I'm, I'm gonna guess that's leather, but actually it's meant to be Lorica Segmentata, which is banded iron armor, which, which is accurate for this period of the Principate Roman Empire. Three weeks from now, I will be harvesting my crops. Imagine where you will be. And it will be so. I love this quote as well. I love, I love this quote. Russell Crowe is absolutely on his A game in this movie. go to the forming Testudo to um, take the fire from the Germans, which is accurate. Something's wrong here in the sequence that's about to happen though, in the way the legionaries engage. So the legionaries should stop about 100 meters away from the Germans and each, each legionary should throw his lighter pillar, uh, um, lead weight to javelin. And then when he closes to almost point blank range, he should stop again and then throw his heavier um, Pillum led way to javelin, and then and only then should he draw his principal weapon, which is his Gladius Hispaniensis. The sword that um, is being used there actually by Maximus, by Russell Crowe, is also accurate because it's not a Gladius infantry sword, which is a stabbing weapon more than anything. The cavalry were on with a spatha, which is a longer weapon giving greater reach, so you can reach down and start smacking people from the saddle. So the sword he's using there is actually accurate. In the world of Rome, you have a theatre, which is the half round, you, and which you have a performance and poetry things. You have the Odeon, which is a theatre with a roof. You have the circus, where you have the chariot races. And then ultimately you have the Big E, which is the, the amphitheatre, in this case the Colosseum, where you have the gladiatorial combats and etc. Terrible weapon, the Gladius Hispaniensis. Didn't have any blood runnels. So there's no way for the air to come out uh, of a wound and no way for the blood to run out of a wound either. So therefore, when the sword went in, it was very difficult to take out. So you had to give it a massive twist, which created a terrible, terrifying wound. So it was a psychological weapon. There's Whacking Phoenix. Portraying, I have to say, Commodus in an incredibly uh, fantastic way captures the madness of the man. I, I would say Commodus. There are a lot of Roman emperors who are mad or bad, but Commodus is the one who is mad and bad. If you watch any Roman movie, I can guarantee that some way, shape or form, the director or the producers will try and shoo in somewhere something to do with gladiators. Would you get a Roman general, even in the most extreme circumstances, as um, a gladiator? No, I don't think so, especially I mean, um, Russell Crowe goes out of his way in Gladiator, as an example, to say that he's the general of the armies of the north. So the important thing to remember here is that a gladiator is a slave. If you can enslave a Roman soldier, then yes, ultimately he could become a gladiator, I guess. 
and Roman soldiers were enslaved in civil war context and that kind of thing. So certainly Roman soldiers may have found themselves in the arena as gladiators and then have been very good ones because they're trained soldiers. Fantastic movie, um, really, really a sort of like uh, hits my mark where I want at least 50% to be accurate historically and a lot more is actually accurate historically. Some bits are wrong, uh, but particularly based on the initial battle scene, which is fabulous, uh, I give it eight out of 10. To be upfront, I don't think this is a very good movie, okay? But aspects of it are very, very good, and one of the best aspects is the recreation of the town of Pompeii. We'll meet you back at the villa. The lady! <laughs> if you're, you, you're a woman, girl or a woman, from the top of Roman society, your, your um, options, your choices about your own life are limited. Um, probably there was more choice lower, lower, lower down. And actually, there's a very famous um, uh, portrayal uh, from Pompeii of a baker and his wife, um, which is now on display uh, in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. The, the, the baker himself, the male, is very well dressed, clearly made it, etc. But his wife, she's the one who's holding the stylus and the writing material. So the literate one who's keeping the books is actually... Not the baker, but his wife. <laughs> so you get a public toilet next door to a really posh house, next door to a street vendor, as we're seeing in this scene here, etc. So, so oh, there we are, there are the stepping stones. So actually, that's fantastic. So it really is a good recreation of Pompeii. And another thing you see, actually, this is a terrible movie in my opinion, but another thing you see very accurately here, which you really feel oppressively once you know where you're looking at, is the proximity of Vesuvius. Wow, right, so we've got the Plinian eruption. So this is Vesuvius at full blast. So with this particular eruption, you have the top blowing off Vesuvius. And actually you can see that writ large today. So when you look at Vesuvius from the, uh, even after subsequent uh, eruptions, if you look at Vesuvius today from the forum in Pompeii, you can see the chunk to the right hand side, which got blown off in this explosive eruption. There you can see the huge amount of panic caused by this eruption. What we do know now actually is that quite a lot of people had already evacuated Pompeii because they've been um, telegraphed that there were gonna be problems in the days before the event because there was a series of earthquakes and they could tell that the, uh, the, the, the volcano itself um, was likely going to have some kind of eruption. In actual fact, um, we know a huge amount of Pompeii through the juxtaposition of two of the key tools that archaeologists use when they're trying to understand the site. You've got history, uh, but also we have the amazing archaeology because the town was buried under um, um, several metres, tens of metres of uh, volcanic um, ash and dust and waste and detritus. Um, and it's maintained much of the city in a way that you don't normally get in any Roman site. It's all there laid out for you. You know exactly where it is, almost unlike any other Roman site in the world. So if I'm being really honest, actually, that I've had to try really hard to get Pompeii wrong. That's probably been a bit mean-spirited. And I don't think it's a well-made movie. That's not to take away some aspects of it, which actually historically are very good. The portrayal of Pompeii itself is excellent, and the portrayal of the Plinian eruption is excellent. But apart from that, it's preposterous. So I would give it three out of 10. Ship ready, console. This is a movie I'd probably end up watching, even if it's only wallpaper, it's on television, probably twice a year, actually. 
here you have this elite piece of ancient technology, military technology, the warship, probably a trireme galley or a quinker marine. Um, so that'll be three, three backs of oars or five backs of oars being rowed by slaves. Absolute rubbish. There is no evidence anywhere at all. With the task of seeking out and destroying them. No evidence whatsoever that they used slaves. They were all professional rowers. So in the in the Roman world, they were called romigas, and they were paid the same amount of money as an auxiliary infantryman or an auxiliary cavalryman. And and you know nine tenths of the crew of a war galley are going to be people rowing the oars. So why on earth do you think you would like put the future success of this piece of elite tech, military technology? in the hands of slaves, even if they were being whipped. There's the drums, bang, 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 bang. So that probably is accurate. But they would have been professional rowers, so that's absolute nonsense. Uh, so the ratio of slaves to free people in Italy was probably one to 10. And the highest would probably have been in Egypt, where I've seen references to it being one in three, which is like very, very unusual. Yeah. Those slaves themselves, the one in turn, those slaves themselves, there's a huge differential between their experiences of life as well. So slavery is bad. Your experience of being a slave is bad. You have no control over your own destiny. That's bad, right? Let's be absolutely clear about that. But then once you look at the differential experience of being a slave, you could on the one hand be um, sort of a Greek scholar, who uh, is the teacher of, of their own as children, a grammarian. And then all the way at the very bottom, you've got people who are condemned to work in the metalla. So they're working in the mines. If you are condemned to work in the metalla, the bit that's missing is you're condemned to work in the metalla to death. If you go in the hole, you don't come out. Metalla is a mine. If you go in the hole, you don't come out. Fantastic. Right, this is one of the most iconic scenes of any movie, ancient history or otherwise. It's the, the chariot race in Ben-Hur. Every Roman major city sort of had a circus and the recreation of it here, this sort of hippodrome for the horse racing, is really, really accurate. I mean, they've absolutely nailed it. Remember people of the past, they're like us but different. And one of the ways they're different is they have a completely different sense of um, sort of like casual violence to us. So this race here would have been sponsored by incredibly wealthy individuals. And one of the things you have to remember, if you remember the public, is that once you're sitting down, you're not allowed to go anywhere. <laughs> because there are lots of bailiffs and guards, etc., all around. You don't want to be the person to be seen to be um, not being too grateful for the person paying vast amounts of wealth to show off how clever they are and how successful they've been. <laughs> And again, you can see here, look at that, you've got the side chariots. There's no evidence, by the way, that side chariots were actually used in Roman chariot racing, actually. It, it was proper racing as such, you know, like the Formula One racing of their day. Clearly, one of the things which is very wrong, I think, about Ben-Hur is the fact that, that um, Judah Ben-Hur is portrayed as a slave rowing in a warship. You'd, that, that wouldn't have happened. They'd have been professional rowers. But it does give a very good representation of what life is like as a slave in the Roman world. It's a very normal part of existence of Roman life, slavery. So let's look at Roman societal structure. At the very top, you have the senators, and then below that, two of the classes of noble or aristocrat. So you have the equestrians and then the curials. And then below that, you have free men who are people who have never been slaves. And then you have freed men who are people who have been slaves but have been freed, they've been manumitted. And finally, slaves. Only the top senators are patricians, everybody else is a plebe. But the key there is, even if you're a slave, you can actually earn your money, uh, earn your way out of slavery through um, earning money or through good service. And it's very common to be manumitted. So a Roman emperor, Pertinax, was the son of a slave who became the emperor of Rome. Ben-Hur is one of the biggest 
movies of all time. It's a spectacular blockbuster. It's Hollywood at its best. Huge amounts of money thrown at it. Um, I give it seven out of 10. It is a good movie. So the way that the native Britons of the far north of Britain, let's say the Brigantes, from, from either side of um, what later became the line of Hadrian's Wall, they're very well portrayed here, they're exceptionally well portrayed here. and they've got the right hand accurately. Very, very good, right hand accurately. You can see also very accurately how, how high up the pommel is of the Gladius Hispaniensis, actually, and that's to allow it to be drawn in a very specific fencing technique so the blade flips up. formations holding, this is elite military training, using elite military equipment of the day, very, very, very well represented in a movie. Um, and with the narrative of the movie uh, based on Rose and Sutcliffe's book, making it a really, really good watch. Even for a Roman military historian like me, who can get very picky, I just think this is fabulous. And they're now reforming while in combat, which elite military troops, including legions of the Principate, could do. Legions have been freed, told to pick up a weapon, because you don't want to carry anybody when you're in a military situation like that, with huge amounts of jeopardy. I can't remember if the chariots have got sides or not. If they haven't got sides, I'll be pleased because they shouldn't have sides. Key piece of technology. Oh, they got sides. Oh, boo. Many people do think actually that these chariots actually weren't shot weapons at all, but they were battlefield taxis to allow an aristocrat to ride up and down a Roman line or an opponent's line. So in terms of the Romans engaging, um, the natives of the far north of Britain, uh, they would have got nowhere near the Scottish Highlands. And in actual fact, this is portraying the Britons that Channing Tatum's characters engage with in the scene as being on the Western Isles. And there's no way the Romans would have got anywhere near that. Marcus, Flavius, Aquila. So here, there's no way on earth that the Aquila Eagle Standard of the Ninth Legion, as it's meant to be here, based on Rosemary Sutcliffe's book, The Eagle of the Ninth, would have found its way all the way through to the Western Isles. To the Romans, it was very clear. You were either part of the civilised world, i.e. in the Roman Empire, or you were in Barbaricum. You were outside the Roman Empire. So to them, you were in or out. That's it. And the interesting thing for us, of course, is that we see things differently. So we th see things through the prism of, on the one hand, um, 19th century and early 20th century imperialism in the way that the world's portrayed and the world of the past is portrayed through that. So if you were to look, for example, at the, 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 the representation of <clears throat> the barbarians, the bad guys in the movie The Eagle, it's a great example, actually, painted um, other different, in, in actual fact, the way the Romans would have engaged across Hadrian's Wall or the Antonine Wall with the peoples of the far north of Britain um, um, 
would have been an absolutely normal part of their life and the people they're engaging with were just northern britons how could you go wrong with the story of the eagle of eagle of the ninth rosemary sutcliffe's blockbuster sort of from the early 1950s and there's generations of children who've grown up and they're first learning about the roman world is reading her amazing book about the lost lost eagle the eagle of the ninth which in this movie the eagle with channing tatum is beautifully recreated it's very faithful to the book um, I love the book. I've actually written my own book about what happened um, to to the Ninth Legion, and 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 I reference the movie in my book. I say in my book this is actually a very good recreation of what the Roman military would have been like at this time. The battle scene is nailed on; it's spot on. Particularly the physical training of the Roman soldiers, the legionaries, that really is nailed on. Um, there are aspects of it which aren't as good. Say, for example, the fact that um, the movie has the natives of the far north of Britain in the Scottish Isles or the Highlands, well, that wasn't the case. But mostly, this is a great movie, actually, and I will give this movie 9 out of 10. Check out the History Hit YouTube, where you can get great exclusive videos and a sneak peek at what's available on the world's best history channel, History Hit TV. It's going really fast. We're thrilled to have you all aboard.